Okay, hi, I am Felicia Cooper, and today we're gonna to talk about Nina Efimova Simonovich. Um, there is a lot to talk about when it comes to Nina Efimova Simonovich. She's considered like the grandmother of Russian puppet theater. Um, so we're gonna focus in on the lens of uh, what I've done as a study in modernity and community engagement in her work. So this is Nina Efimova Simonovich. She was born in 1877 to uh, members of the Russian intelligentsia and her parents founded the first kindergarten in Moscow, which really informed, I think, a lot of her work. They also happened to um, work through a sort of um, journal, a pedagog pedagogical journal. And so this comes up in her work a lot, this value of education, this value of what children are learning. She was she studied painting at the Moscow School of Painting, Sculpture, and Architecture, and was actually a student of uh, Matisse. However, at the advent of the October Re Revolution, she could no longer paint. She said that she no longer could create anything which didn't immediately serve the people of Russia and in, in their crisis. And so what could serve the people of Russia in their crisis better than puppetry? Um, and that's her with uh, Baba Yaga, which was one of the many, many fables and fairy tales that she performed. So she and her husband, Ivan, went on tour across the Volga and Kama rivers. Um, and in her memoir, Adventures of a Russian Puppet Theater, she talks at length about the regional disparities that she encountered and how she adjusted to them. Uh, at a certain point, she said that she could no longer walk through Moscow without passing by a venue at which she had performed. This is her husband, Ivan, holding a puppet um, of Ivan Krylov. Ivan Krylov was a fabulist. He was widely recognized and he was kind of a trusted narrator. I can liken him to kind of like the Shel Silverstein of his era. And because he was such a trusted narrator, he kind of introduces us to um, the stories that they would tell, as well as the contract of puppetry. And in a piece called The Hermit and the Bear, the performance begins with Krylov inviting the audience to imagine with him an invisible fly around the ceiling. And this immediately shows people how to watch a puppet show, how to engage in that cognitive dissonance. Also really present in uh, all of Efimova's work was a focus on the movement, a focus on um, gesture as the language of expression that is best suited towards puppets. Um, I can't help but think that she was probably influenced by her peer Vladislav Meyerhold, who uh, engaged in a codification of the body as object in his famous etudes. Um, she was so focused on qualities of movements to the point where she would say certain types of stories had various qualities of movements. And I think that this was best exemplified in two examples. Um, we have a picture of Efimova with giant Petrushka, which was a full body puppet controlled by her dancing in 1930, as well as a dramatically successful performance of Macbeth with rod puppets. Pretty remarkable for the era. She had stated that um, she was inspired by Indonesian puppet theater uh, in their use of rods to control puppets above their heads. Um, and she had seen them in a museum. So immediately there's some accessibility that, um, of cultural understanding that occurs that influences her work. Um, however, she was really focused on the materiality of her puppets, what they were made of, and how that influenced what we perceive of them. Um, to the point where she asked her husband Ivan to use his fur coat to create a bear uh, as the weather got warmer. The bear being, of course, a symbol of um, Russia at the time and still, um, but her designs for bears were so specific and so technically proficient um, that she had a different bear for so many different stories and they would all do different things. Uh, she really rejected the teddy bear um, and thought that the bear should be more fierce. However, a lot of her focus on materiality was also a collaboration because people knew that she was a puppet a puppeteer, they would bring her clothes that they could no longer use in order for her to make puppets. Um, I think all of this materiality, um, accessibility, and uh, focus on movement all really speaks to her distillation of an image to tell a story. And of course, we can't talk about a turn of the century Russian puppeteer without talking about her political uh, participation. We know that at the time the ruling class was being ousted, the Bolsheviks were rising, um, and there was a ton of economic disparity and a lot of um, 
people really struggling to survive. And the 1919 May Day celebration, um, her and her husband performed in this traveling puppet stage that we see here. Um, and I'm going to read to you exactly uh, her account. I remember the May Day celebration in Moscow in 1919. By request of the Bureau of Education, we rode all over the city in a covered float, performing from the open back in successive places before important buildings, such as the House of Rosa Luxemburg, the Turgny of Library, the Red Gates of the Kremlin, and the Terrace of the Zoological Gardens. As the wagon was going through the streets between these places, we performed impromptu sketches of whatever came into our heads. The van moved along and we played on and on, inspired by the festive procession, the gay moving throngs, the fine weather. Passers-by, both adults and children, glancing at our float and seeing the puppets in action would turn and without a word or a moment's hesitation, rush after us. This aroused us to even greater efforts, making it impossible to stop playing. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that on the exact same day, the May Day riots were happening in Cleveland, just to give some context. Um, and so I think this is a wonderful example of modern community engagement. Uh, she, was implementing a sliding scale for her audiences before we had such a model. Uh, she would assess different towns and see whether she would be able to charge uh, a potato or whether she would be able to charge money that day. Uh, she had made a lot of accommodations, especially when she was performing at institutions for children with behavioral and intellectual disabilities. Uh, she served in immediate need of the people, uh, whatever the people would need, she thought the people would need to see that day. For instance, her performance of A Banquet of Authors, which featured uh, venerated authors of the time, um, Shakespeare, etc., cetera, uh, would be for, performed for a very different audience than How a Peasant Fed Two Generals, which was in which the peasant saves the day through his own resourcefulness. And so I think through her immediacy of response, her sensitivity to present circumstances, her incredible respect for education, um, starting at a very young age, and her dedication to accessibility, she was able to make a significant impact and she was able to really influence what puppet theater became. This is a wonderful example of puppetry as the art of the people. And I'll close here with a quote from her. I felt that theater was what people very, the people very much needed at that stormy period. They looked at it with hungry eyes. Theater was then like bread. There's my sources. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>